Good morning, church family. How are we today? Let's get on our feet. We're going to worship Jesus in this place. He's worthy of our praise. He's such a good God today. We thank him for his mercy. that we can trust this 
morning. We have a God that is so faithful and so kind to us. He's a father unlike any other. And we can put our hope in him this morning. Come on, let's sing, you are good. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. Let's sing, you are peace. is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life and your death has lost its sting I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, and nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world.
Jesus. Jesus. There is no other God, and my heart will sing no other name. Jesus. Lord, nothing comes before you, and my heart will sing no other name. Jesus. Nothing is greater, nothing is higher than him. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. There's no other name but Jesus. There's no other one but you, God. Thank you, Lord. shadows and you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God come on church
God, we trust you in this moment right now. Lord, we believe that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. God, you have a purpose. You have not forgotten us, Jesus. You have not left us on this earth to be alone. God, but you have provided a comforter for us that is like no other. There is no other one that is higher than you. There is no other one that is greater than you. Jesus, we commit ourselves to you in this moment right now. We put our trust and our faith in you, knowing that you will see us through the end. Your word says that you are the perfecter, the finisher, the author of our faith. And so, God, we trust in you. You have never failed us once. Never once have you left us, God, and you never will. God, we believe that there are greater things still yet to come. Lord, and we know that you are working it out right now, even though we can't see it, even though we can't feel it, you are working it out. God, but when we fight, we fight on our knees with our hands lifted high in an act of surrender to you, completely countercultural to whatever this world says. But Lord, we put our trust in you and we rest in you, knowing that you are fighting our battles. And all you want for us is just to be still. So in this moment right now, we are still before you. Lord, steady our hearts in this moment. God, open up our ears to hear your word. Speak a word of life into us that we will be forever changed. God, we thank you for being good. We thank you for being kind to us, God. And Lord, our hearts are full and hearts are ready to receive from you today. God, it's in the power and the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping. You can be seated. Well, welcome, everybody. Who's excited to be at church today? Good. <clears throat> I am, too. The, the awesome thing is, is no matter where you're at, whether you are here, your hearts are full, and you're celebrating, and life is good, this is a great place to be to give God praise. If you're here and you had to drag yourself here and you didn't really want to be here and you had questions and, and life's just hard, you're struggling, this is also a great place to be because God is here with us. So I want to say welcome and I want to say thank you for joining us because there's a lot of places you could be today and I'm excited that you're here with us. If you're visiting with us today, we've got some connect cards in the back. We'd love for you to fill one of those out. We've got a little gift for you. You can drop it off at the welcome booth right here. It's an opportunity for us to uh, be able to share some information with you about the different ministries and events we have going on as a church. But on the back, there's also a spot where you can share any prayer requests you might have. And each week as a staff, we get together and we pray for those prayer requests. And so we encourage you to use those. It's a great way to stay connected with you. I wanna thank all of you who showed up to our volunteer meeting last week. We had like 40 people show up to that. We got five or six new people plugged in volunteering with our kids' ministries, and um, it's making a difference. You know, just last week, we had about 65 uh, kids between nursery and sixth grade here at church last Sunday. Um, you know, we've got youth group that's meeting every Wednesday, so we're ministering to, I think this last week, over 85 individual students, which is incredible, but it also takes a lot of volunteers. And so we want people who are passionate about Jesus, who love investing in our future generations, who would love to join us in helping in some capacity invest in our children. Um, our baptism class, so there's several of you who have signed up. I think we've got about six people signed up. If you're interested in being baptized and you haven't been yet, join me right here. You go through this little door here into our hospitality room right after this service, and I'm going to be meeting with everybody talking about what baptism is, why we, why we celebrate that, and, and what it means to join us in baptism. So I would love for anybody, even if you just have questions and you're not sure you're ready, that's a great opportunity to come and ask those questions. And then finally, on February 7th, we have a membership class. And what we do there is we get together, we talk about who we are as a church, what we believe, what our focus is, what our mission is, and how we're trying to accomplish that and, and make a difference in the community around us. And so if you have any questions about who we are, how you can get involved, what we believe, 
again, that's a great opportunity to get together, get to know some other people, and uh, a great place to ask those questions. So mark your calendars for uh, February 7th from 2 to 5 if you're interested in, in that event. So today we are continuing in our series, The Kingdom, talking about the kingdom of God. This comes from the book of Matthew. Last week, uh, the, ser the sermon was titled The Shift because we started to see a shift in Jesus' ministry. But there was just too much to do in one week, so I broke it into two. So this is The Shift Part 2. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 18 through 23. And I want to take just a moment and reflect on last Sunday. If you were here, you know, there, it was just a special day. There was a, a really strong presence of God in the room. I don't know how else to describe it. But I've, I've had a chance to talk to several people this week who just said, you know, God spoke to me last week. And, and I just felt him calling me to a deeper commitment. I, I felt God calling me to step out of my comfort zone and really get involved in, in, in living for him and, and moving beyond just going through the motions, but taking my faith seriously and, and basically saying, I'm all in in my faith, which is exciting. Like, that's what this is all about. That's exactly what God is calling us to. Last week in our sermon, we talked about from the book of Matthew, from his perspective, we begin to see this shift in Jesus' ministry taking place. So, you know, in Jesus' life, he grows up and he's learning and, and you know, going to the temple like most, you know, Jewish boys who are pursuing that, that call to, to be a teacher. But then something begins to shift where he kind of goes, goes off a little bit and he, he goes and he's baptized by John and he, he goes out and, and starts calling these fishermen as his disciples. And, and it wasn't uncommon for teachers of the day to have disciples, people they invested in and they taught. It was very uncommon to go to the fishing docks and start calling these fishermen who come from, you know, who knows what kind of background, and they're not the proper pedigree and all of that, but that's who Jesus chooses. And, and even the way he calls them, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Like most people be like, what are you talking about? But they went and they were obedient. And, and we begin to see that he's, he's performing miracles and crowds are gathering and they're excited like, wow, th this is awesome. But then he starts to rub shoulders with some of the religious leaders and starts to push and, and challenge some of their, their power and their authority and some of the beliefs that they had. And suddenly they weren't so excited, right? He's causing a ruckus. They, they enjoyed the attention on them. They enjoyed all of the focus on them and what they had to offer. And so they begin to get frustrated. And we see in uh, chapter 14 where eventually John the Baptist is actually beheaded at a party. And, and Jesus begins to mourn. The, the disciples were getting a little bit concerned about this. And then in chapter 17, we, we see Jesus transition and, and he takes um, three of his disciples up on a hillside, Peter, James, and John, and he says, it's important for you guys to see this. Jesus is setting the stage knowing that something's about to change. And he knows it's crucial that he invests in the faith of these three guys so that when his time comes, meaning when his time to be crucified on the cross comes, it's going to be a big blow to people thinking, wait, this is a Messiah. This is a king. This is the one who's supposed to set us free, and now he's dead. What do we do? And so Jesus knew he had to invest in the faith of these three so that they understood, that they would stand strong and say, listen, have hope. Like, we, we know who this is. We saw Jesus in all of his glory. We, we've seen his earthly ministry. But now we saw the glory of God in this transfiguration. We saw Moses and Elijah, and, and our lives have been forever changed. So this shift is really a shift away from Jesus' earthly ministry and a focus on his fulfillment of the prophecy and, and the entire reason he came to finally conquer sin and death and, and offer a way out, a way of redemption for all of humanity. And so we're going to pick up today in chapters 18 through 23 as we move closer and closer to the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is the fourth chunk of scripture that's often referred to as the discourse on the church. So basically, this is Jesus specifically addressing uh, the challenges of dealing with sin in the community of faith, in the community of grace, and what forgiveness and redemption looks like. So this is truly the teaching on the communal life of the church. So for us, that means, hey, we really need to listen up, right? This is Jesus specifically talking to the religious leaders and to those who are a part of the church. So chapter 18 starts with a question by the disciples asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
and we see a very interesting response by Jesus. Matthew 18, 2 through 9 says this. He called a little child to him, and he placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. All right, that's pretty bold. That's, that's pretty direct. But first, as we examine this text, we see that this really is a power play by the disciples. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? Like, you'd have to imagine these guys are questioning this and saying, well, I've done this, and look what I did, and I, I did this miracle, and, you know, all of this bickering back and forth. And so they naturally wonder, well, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the most important? Who's done the most? Who's going to have the seat of honor? And I think all of us, to some degree, if we're honest, can probably relate to this. Wanting to get that raise, wanting to be the team captain, wanting to be chosen first, wanting to be loved, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be recognized. It's, an, it's a natural desire that, that we have. The problem is we live in a fallen world, right? And so we're constantly at this battle of what is natural doesn't mean it's what's right. And so this is where Jesus continues to frustrate people. And we have this choice, are we going to live in the kingdom of God and serve him, or are we going to live in our kingdom and serve ourselves? Culturally, it's very common and important for these men to be seeking and pursuing honor. Jesus surprises them, though, with a child. Now, this is important to understand, too, because it's, it's not the same as, as, it, as if this would have happened today. At this time, the Greco-Roman view of children was much different than our current view. In fact, the word here, child, actually is interchangeable with the word slave. Children had an incredibly low social status. The head of a house actually had total authority over children, including, and not limited to, selling them into slavery. In fact, the, world, the, the word here, child, literally means slave, so it makes sense. But at this time, it wasn't uncommon, especially for infants. The infant mortality rate was extremely high because it wasn't uncommon for babies to be killed due to illness, due to paternal questions, um, due to an inability or even just an, a lack of a desire to care for the child, due to deformities. And so it was completely acceptable to just end a child's life because you didn't feel like dealing with it. The life of a child, especially one who wasn't particularly strong or promising or just born to the wrong family at the wrong time, was difficult and treacherous and, if nothing else, very sad and hard and lonely. Like, children were truly hoping they just made it to adulthood, and that wasn't a guarantee. So the, the physical presence of a child in this setting embodying complete social insignificance and, and honestly, a complete indifference to greatness because their focus wasn't on honor. Their focus was on surviving. It set a very different tone for these disciples and for anybody who saw what was happening. See, what Jesus is doing is he's showing a complete radical shift in the kingdom of God. And, and so for us as a church, we have to say, okay, what does this mean for us today? What does true greatness in God's kingdom look like? Who is he using and what does this mean unless you become like a child? It, it was totally recognizing their dependence on God alone and recognizing there was nothing they could do to earn or gain this honor. And it's the same for us. Listen, we need to recognize there is nothing 
that we can do to forgive ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to earn the love of God because we know the standard of God through the word of God says we are judged according to God's perfect standard. Not a single person that's ever walked this earth other than Jesus Christ himself is perfect. Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so what we begin to recognize is our salvation is completely dependent on God choosing to love us and to forgive us in spite of ourself. Jesus is trying to get them to see that it's not about them. It's not about being honored and respected. It's about lifting up those who cannot lift up themselves. It's about caring for those who are deemed invaluable to society. It's about showing love and respect to those who have absolutely nothing to offer in return, those who normally don't receive love and respect. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. And notice he says, unless you change and become like, this is a key. It's not about where we are right now, but it's about who are we becoming. We have a choice in the matter, right? We can either choose to live for God and honor him and the things of the kingdom and truly put God first, or we can choose to do things our own way and to choose our own path on our own priorities and, and make it all about us and our place of honor. But what Jesus is saying is don't worry about who's honored. The one that's gonna be honored is the one who's lifted up who has nothing because they will receive salvation and your job is to take that message to them. See, that is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And then Jesus follows us up with a very clear and a very direct warning. One of the commentaries that I was studying this week addresses it by saying this, Jesus is really pushing the common ideas of power and authority within the faith community, within the church. Greatness versus humility. Social positioning, greatness versus shame. He's calling for a renunciation of the obsession with self-importance. Now think about that in light of the culture that we live in today. The new leaders of the holy people of God are to reflect the values of the kingdom and challenge the widely accepted cultural patterns. He issues this with a warning, unless you change you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's about being transformed. It's about being made new. It's not about just saying, this is who I am and this is what you get, God, but it's about saying, Lord, make me more like you. Help me to care about the things that you care about. Help me to love the way that you love. Help me to forgive the way you forgive. Help me to live life with a new purpose. It's not about me getting my way and getting my things and being successful and getting honor, but it's about how do I lift others up? who can't help themselves? How do I come alongside and love people who the rest of the culture around me says doesn't deserve love? How do I show kindness to people that have maybe not shown kindness to me? We must abandon the quest for self-power and for honor. All of these culturally driven concerns should be put aside and we should be completely focused on serving one another and on humility, regardless of anybody's social, ethnic, gender, or cultural background or boundaries, it should be seen that you are created in the image of God. And my job is to love you more than I love myself. Listen, that's a challenge. And it's something that many of us in the church have heard often, love your neighbor is better than yourself. But think about that. Do I really love everybody that I encounter more than I love me? Do I put your priorities ahead of mine? Do I put raising you up ahead of me getting ahead in life? You see this tension that Jesus is calling out. Remember, this isn't anymore just speaking to the crowd. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, to the religious leaders, and to the church, saying, church, this is for you. So this is for us. The warning we see about causing these little ones to stumble is also very important. See, the language of welcoming and hospitality are just opposed to causing them to stumble. There are several possibilities that we can imply from what this would actually mean. Part of it is ignoring their low social position and saying we're going to love them regardless. But it's also vivid language about stepping up for those because the way the language is written in this passage it directly lends itself toward um, sexual abuse of children. And at this time in the Greco-Roman world, 
this was not only a very common practice, it was very accepted and in often cases encouraged. In, in some uh, Roman traditions, it was actually seen as a rite of passage. And, and so what Jesus is saying is, we are not a part of this world and this kingdom, and it's wrong. And it's not only time for you to start loving, but to start calling out wrong for what it is. And do not let it take root in the church. Do not let the outside inform who we are. We are a people of God. We have a standard, and that is the word of God, and that does not change. And we need to stand strong on that and not let ourselves be swayed and say, well, at least I didn't. Or I'm not as bad as we're not judged by that. We're judged by the perfect standard of God. And we have to say, God, how do I line up to your perfect standard? Is there any offensive way in me? I'm here to tell you every single day I wake up and I know that there are some offensive ways in me. And I say, God, please help me overcome that. Help me to grow. Help me to take those selfish desires. Help me to be more patient. Help me to be more kind and more loving. I know that I have a lot of work to do. Really, what we see is this is a warning to any action that you might do that may prevent anyone, especially the most vulnerable, from truly following Jesus. And there's no mincing of words or beating around the bush here. I mean, this is a direct command from God. And for me, this raises this question. God, is there anything that I do that may cause someone else especially children or the most vulnerable around me, to stumble in their faith or to prevent them from following you? Think about that question for a moment. Because initially I want to say, well, no. But, but then I begin to think about it. You know, I, I've got little kids at home. They're watching the way that I respond. They're watching the things that I say. Are they seeing grace and mercy and truth and love? Or are they seeing anger and bitterness and, and selfishness? And my personal agenda and my personal opinion, or are they seeing a man who's truly following the word of God? I have to constantly remind myself, am I leading my life by example, pointing people to Jesus or somewhere that I really don't want them to go? It's a hard question, and it's one that we should take seriously if we're truly trying to follow Christ. I, I think about all of these things and say, God, how can you help me be a better example for you. 1 Corinthians 10.23 talks about this as well, saying, many things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Many things are not sin, but not everything is beneficial to the kingdom of God, to our continual growth in our relationship with Jesus, and they may actually be a hindrance to others in their faith. And, and, and what did Jesus just say before that? If there's anything you do that causes someone else to stumble, say something you do with your hand, you're better off cutting off your hand and throwing it away than causing somebody else to go down the wrong path. You see what this means? It's again, getting the focus off of ourself. It's not about me. It's not about my personal liberties. It's not about what's permissible for me, but it's about saying, God, in everything I do, is there anything that's not pointing people to you? Is there anything I do that's pointing people away from a relationship with you or from your truth? Is there anything where somebody could say, well, Pastor Josh did that, so it's got to be okay, right? God, help me to not ever lead somebody astray that way. And Lord, help nobody to see me as Jesus. I'm a flawed, broken person desperately in need of salvation of Jesus Christ, doing my best to serve him but still stumbling and making mistakes. The thing is we have to be focused on saying, yes, I have fallen down, but I'm going to get up and God don't ever let me do it again. It's not just about making an excuse and saying, well, I'm a flawed human, right? So it's all good. I'm covered by grace. It's about saying, and because of that, Lord, never let me abuse that grace again. Never let me make that mistake again. Help me to have strength to overcome that, to truly point people to you in all that I do, in all that I say, in all of the places that I go. We need to understand Jesus is telling us to be aware of and take responsibility for those things and then to do something to change it. And we continue with many parables in this passage about Jesus going after every single person that his focus is on those who are, are still living in death. 
and that he wants us to have that same focus. We have the story of the rich young ruler coming and, and talking about how he's obeyed all of the laws and all of the commandment. What must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? I, I've done everything you've asked. And Jesus says, and sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me. And he went away sad. See, are we fully committed to Jesus in every aspect, or is there something we're holding on to? See, for the rich young ruler, he'd worked really hard on being a good guy. He'd worked really hard on knowing all of the laws and obeying them, but he really was successful in his finances. And that was something he had a hard time letting go of to the point where Jesus said, you have one thing left, sell everything you have and follow me. But he was holding on too tightly to that. He couldn't let it go. And he went away sad. We have to ask ourselves, is there anything that we're holding on to like that, that we're not willing to let go of? Because again, that puts the focus back on us. It makes it about us and our agenda and our providing rather than fully trusting God and saying, here I am, use all of me. It's not about me. It's not about me. I'm all in. In, the math, in Matthew 20, 28, we have a very familiar passage. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Listen, this series is about going deeper in our understanding of the kingdom of heaven and what it means to be a citizen of that kingdom. And it means a radical shift from the culture around us. And I think you're probably picking up on that by now. The life that Christ is calling us to live and the life that Jesus Christ lived does not mimic or look in any way similar to the culture that we currently find ourselves living in, right? We don't see many of our leaders standing up and being completely self-sacrificial and, and pushing away honor and glory and respect. We don't see many people standing up and giving away all that they've worked so hard to earn for somebody who doesn't even appreciate it. Yet this is exactly what the kingdom of heaven is about. It's completely in opposition to the kingdom we live in. Jesus was addressing the disciples, but he was also talking about the collective body of believers. That, that's you and I, of what it means to be leaders in the kingdom of God. This is a message of servanthood and radical self-denial for the sake of Christ and for the sake of others. And that's challenging in our culture. How do we take and live this seriously today? What does it really look like lived out in your life to live this way? Think about that for a moment. Like if you really took all of these teachings and really tried to apply them to your life, how might your life look different? More important question, I think, how might the lives of the people around you look different? The people you go to school with, your neighbors, your coworkers, your, your family members. If we truly live this way, putting others above ourselves, realizing it's not about me, but it's about introducing other people to Jesus. And, and God, use anything that I have. It's, it's all yours because it's more important that they understand salvation and freedom than anything that I, I've already got it. I'm set, I'm good. I need to focus on them. That's what we're called to do as a church. This is a message of servanthood. And it's, a, it's hard to embrace this teaching in our culture that encourages self-promotion and it worships fame and it values winners and it despises losers. And generally we operate in this honor shame paradigm and it goes against the very human inclination to dominate others. I mean, think about it. I am a very competitive person to the point that I don't even want to play a game if I don't think that I have a chance of winning. To me, it's, it's not about the game. The, the game's not fun. Beating you is fun, right? Like, that's who I am. I want to destroy anybody at anything I do. And it's, it's not godly, you know what I mean? Like, the reality is we need to move beyond ourselves and recognize that is the culture we live in. Anything at the cost of winning, right? But the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God and the kingdom that we as believers say, I'm a part of this kingdom now. I'm dying to the old me that was that way and I'm living for God. And as you begin to see that, that's what we mean when we talk about sanctification. It's about saying, God, I am not going to be that person anymore. I want to be who your word has called me to be. And I, I'm not there yet, but every day 
Help me to make that the focus. Every day, help me to study your word and understand who you're calling me to be so I can be more like that. And so that I can lead and teach others what that means to find true victory and freedom because there's something freeing when we understand I don't have to succeed at everything I do. Because if I'm living for God and if I'm seeking his agenda, I know that he's working everything out and I just have to be willing and, and you know what? There's going to be some conversations I have where people have no interest in Jesus and, and they don't want to listen to anything I, I have to say. Did I fail? No, I did what God called me to do. But I also trust that God continues to seek after that person and to work in their heart and sending others along. We just have to continue to be willing. And so I thought of these questions. How do today's churches and leaders, or more specifically, you and I, express Christ-likeness. Has that changed from the true model that we see in Scripture? What does it mean to follow his example and confront cultural patterns wherever we live? And that's a challenge too, right? It's one thing to say, well, I'm going to live out the principles of God. But what about this confronting cultural issues, right? Like that's a whole other thing. It's one thing to say, well, I'm not going to be abusive to these little ones, but am I going to stand up and do anything to stop it? You see where this really begins to cause a rub. And it really begins to make us think we have to get out of our comfort zone. We're not just called to be innocent bystanders and make sure that we're doing our part, but on top of it, we're to lead the change, right? We're to help those who can't help themselves. We're to be the voice. And you might say, oh, man, I might... I might really make some people mad. Well, if you're doing this Christian thing right, you probably will, right? In fact, look, look what happened to Christ. Look what it cost him. Church, if we are going to take this seriously, it's going to be a hard road because there's going to be that constant battle of, well, I don't even want to play the game if I'm not going to win to know there's going to be a lot of self-sacrifice in this and there's going to be a lot of probably falling on my face. You know, and God's calling me to step out in areas where I don't see how I could possibly succeed. And so then we have this whole issue of faith that begins to come in and say, am I going to trust God? Am I going to trust that God, you've called me to do this, so I'm going to follow. And I don't see how I could possibly succeed, but I'm going to trust that you are there working. How do we live out this upside down, inside out value of the kingdom in our own community of faith, in our own church? See, these are questions that don't go away, and I really think they should be continually asked and at the forefront of who we are as a church and personally in our own self-examination, saying every day, God, who have you called me to be? And am I being faithful to that calling? Is there anything in me that needs to change? Is there anything that I'm holding back? Then chapter 21 moves on to the triumphal entry of Christ. So this is what we talk about when we celebrate Palm Sunday, which, believe it or not, is right around the corner. This is where Jesus has two of his disciples. They go into town ahead of him. They get to Jerusalem. They're getting ready to celebrate the, the largest celebration of this culture, the Passover feast. And he says, hey, go, you're going to find a donkey tied up. Go bring it to me. And so he gets this donkey, and they go prepare a meal, and he rides in, and there's this group of people waving palm branches, saying Hosanna and laying out their robes, which is a stark contrast to what we're going to see in just a few days after this event. But at the same time, we recognize, okay, so this is the king of the Jews. This is, this is the Messiah. This is a savior. And he's riding in on a donkey. And there's a ragtag group, group of uh, fishermen following behind with no religious pedigree. And we just heard that he got ran out of his own hometown and the religious leaders are calling for his arrest. Like, what's going on? This isn't probably the way they expected it to be. And then on the other side of town, you have the Roman officials riding in on their, their horses that are covered in armor and the, the, their swords glistening in the sun and all of them in formation and marching with all of the power of Caesar behind them and all of the money and all of the pomp and all of the circumstance. And so you see this crazy stark contrast between Jesus coming in this direction with that whole goofy scene on a donkey and fishermen and then these Roman officials and, and all of the power and you begin to see very clearly there's a big difference between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. 
the power of this world and the power of Christ. It's not about the outward, look what I've got, but it's about inward, look where I'm going and look what God has done in me and look who I'm becoming. We need to be less focused on what we see right in front of us and what the world values and recognize there's something so much more significant and we as a church should not allow ourselves to get distracted with those things that are completely insignificant. Jesus then makes his way to the temple. And this is where things really begin to shift. The religious leaders are there, they're buying and they're selling and they're ripping people off is what they're doing. And they've made a business out of their practice of religion. And they've gained power and finances preying on the faithful. So Matthew 21, 12 through 13, Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all of those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Again, Jesus is driving these guys nuts. He's now infringing on their power, on their business, on their wealth, on the respect of the people. I mean, how humiliating, right? Jesus coming in and all the people seeing it, they've probably felt, well, this is wrong and this isn't right. And, you know, these guys say this, but they're doing this. And suddenly Jesus exposes it all for what it is. And it's so bad, they say, he is going to die. We're going to kill this man because he's taking everything from us. You see what happens when we hold on to the power of this world. They miss the fact that it was God himself in their presence trying to wake them up and instead, don't wake me up, I'm going to kill you. That's what we see taking place. And I wonder if maybe not in those exact words, in our own heart, do we have that tension with God? Don't take that from me, Lord. I've already given you all of this. I live a, a good life and I do this. And I do. Don't you dare take that from me. We're either all in or we're not all in. That's all there is in the kingdom of God. He either has our heart, all of it, or he doesn't. There's no riding the fence. There's no being relatively morally good enough because we've all fallen short of God's glory. The only reason we have anything is because of the grace of God saying, I love you and I've forgiven you. And he does that, why? Because we've turned away and said, I don't wanna be that person anymore. Make me into the person you created me to be. See, that is what the message of the gospel is all about. It's not just forgiveness, but it's transformation. It's redeeming this world the way that God originally designed it to be. Remember, those who give up their life and their power and their finances and their preferences and their opinions will save it. But those who try to hold on to those things will surely lose their life. And this is a prime example. What are we seeking and what are we holding on to? In chapter 22, we have Jesus explaining further what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven and what is in store for those who choose not to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Near the end in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, we have this short but really crucial passage. Starting in verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they got together one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second, even though they didn't ask him that, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So what does that mean? First of all, Jesus made it very clear, you can't separate those two commands, right? You cannot love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and not love your neighbor as yourself. So we've got to keep those together because Jesus even made it a point to keep those together. He said, all the law and all the prophets hang on these. But what does this love mean? John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commands. Do we truly love Jesus? Are we truly saying, God, I wanna keep all of your commands? Not just pick out the easy ones, not point out where I'm doing okay, but God, am I willing to lay it all down and say, I want to follow all of them. I wanna constantly grow in my understanding of who you are and read your words so that I can be more like you. See, to this point, we have had 
Jesus teaching about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom and who the kingdom is for, but now he makes some very clear statements and proclamations to those who are living in opposition to the kingdom. And particularly, it's the religious hypocrisy. See, in chapter 23 is where we transition from Jesus' earthly ministry to his march toward the cross. He starts off by saying, the scribes and the Pharisees know the law, they know the prophets, so listen to them. But don't do as they do, for they don't practice what they preach. And that hit me particularly hard, uh, being in the position I'm in, and, and really made me ask the question, Lord, am I actually living this out? And it's not just for the pastor, right? Like, this is for all of us, because the word of God says, if you love me, you will be my disciples. We all are called to this high standard, right? And your particular mission field might look different than mine, but we all have to recognize, are we living a life that we just know the right words and we know the things to say, or are we actually living them out? Because I can't think of anything more terrifying than standing before God saying, yeah, you knew. And so it's even worse for you because you still didn't do it. And not only that, but people were watching and you led them astray. I don't want that weight. And, and it's not something where we need to walk around in fear because here's the thing, we know our heart. Are you seeking Christ or not? Are you continually allowing him to make you new? See, that's the beauty of the grace of God is saying, Lord, I know I messed up, but I know I'm on the right path. Help me not to do it again. Help me to be more like you. Help me to love more. Help me to show more mercy. We don't need to walk around constantly fearful of, oh, shoot, I messed up. Am I going to make it to heaven? No, because God knows our heart. He knows what's in here. Who are we living for? Have we truly put God on the center of the throne of our life? He points out all that they do is for show. And all of the expectations that they hand down, they're not actually following themselves. And, and this is a weighty passage. And, and usually we would have more time to, to really dig into this. But I encourage you to go home and read that section of the passage and say, God, what might you be saying to me through this? Matthew 23, 37 through 39 is a shift from Jesus' warning to lamenting and saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is here in Jerusalem. He is with the people of God. He had this really strange entry into the city. He went and he cleared out the temple. He got people so frustrated that they are committed to killing him. He called out the religious hypocrisy. He performed miracles and healings, and he showed his incredible love for those who truly are dependent on him. And he showed how wrong things can go when we think we can do it on our own. Jesus moves from his woe language to this calling out the hypocrisy and a lament saying, if you would just turn to me. And not only is he, is he referencing the psalm, talking about the hen gathering her chicks, but he is revealing once again who he is. Because Jerusalem, this is a people of God. And it says, as a hen gathers her chicks, I wish to gather you, Jerusalem. That means he's God. And he's saying, I still love you in spite of all of this. I still love you. And to show you, I'm still going to the cross if you would just turn and trust in me. Turn away, you don't have to live this way anymore. You don't need to seek honor and respect because I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What does this world possibly have to give you? All you need to do is help others see the true freedom. Yeah, you can make another buck in this life and, and you can get an attaboy and a pat on the back, but what's it gonna mean in a year? What difference is it gonna mean when we reach our time and when we die and we stand before the foot of Jesus? Isn't it better to know that we invested in somebody's life and we stood up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves and we were a voice to those who don't have a voice and we showed love to those who hated us because it's what Jesus told us to do. And every moment of every day we said, God, don't let me make this about me because it's really easy for me to do that. I'm speaking for me right now. But help me to make it about those that I come across, 
those who I intentionally go and build relationships with and those who I'd rather avoid. God, help me to have a love for all people and a grace and a mercy and a humility that can only come from you. He's referencing the destruction that's gonna come to those who continue to live their own way. But he's also talking about the freedom that comes when he becomes our king and the promise of that kingdom that will never end, that cannot be shaken. And the promise for those of us who are a part of that kingdom. Church, I believe that God is calling us, his people today, to stand up and be a part of this kingdom. I believe that we are at a pivotal time in the church I think over the years, the church and many Christians, especially in America, have gotten very comfortable and very complacent. And we've gone through the motions and we've said, we're relatively morally good people. But have we really given Jesus our whole heart? Have we really laid it down and taken this seriously and gone to the point of saying, God, anything, I'm laying it all down, it's all yours. Take me, use me. Get rid of this selfishness and help me to be about you. I believe it's time for us to rediscover what it means to be citizens of the kingdom of God, to rededicate ourselves to the gospel. While Matthew wrote this 2,000 years ago, he was writing it to me. He was writing it to you. He was writing it to our church. It's just as relevant today. We have a choice to make. Are we truly going to be a part of the kingdom of God or are we gonna continue living to serve me? As Kenyon plays this last song, I want you to reflect on that and just ask God to reveal anything in you that might not be from him. Any areas where we might need to surrender and say, God, I want to be about you. I also encourage you, if you've been feeling like I'm I'm in, I want this, but there's some fear holding you back, then say, God, give me the courage I need to be who I know you're calling me to be. Help me to be honest with the work that you've done in my heart and show that to others because the world needs it. Help me to live others focused. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, and we live for you, oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name, Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, and we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. And open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one who could ever say You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. And we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. And open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my 
trust in you alone and i will not be shaken i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken holy there is no one like you and there is none beside you and open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken oh jesus we will not be shaken when we put our trust and our faith in you god when we surrender our will to yours lord there's something amazing that will happen because you change our lives you begin to move and you begin to show us who you are. And you fill us with your goodness and your mercy so we can extend that to those who are around us. This world is not just about us. This relationship that we have with you is not one that just serves us and gives us blessings. But you created us to tell others about you so that they can have a relationship. This life that we live is not our own, but you're calling us deeper into a relationship with you. So Jesus, my prayer this morning today is as my friends are gathered here and people are tuned in online all over the country, Lord, that we will all be in agreement today to know that only your love can change us from the inside out. It is only you that can make all things new in our life. And so God, we dedicate this time to you. We dedicate this moment to you. Lord, and I pray today that if someone today doesn't know you, Lord, that they, they will come find one of us here today and, and ask about how to know, how to know you better how to be in a relationship with you and that we won't walk out the same way that we came in today because we've met with you face to face and, we, and you, you change us. God, I thank you for your goodness in our lives. I thank you for your mercy that is new this morning for us to receive. We give you all the praise and the glory. It's in your name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Have a great day in the Lord. You are dismissed.